So I'm Tom. I'm a Wi-Fi engineer here at Ubiquity. I wear a lot of different hats, but I've been involved with our Wi-Fi 7 products since the very beginning, since we were scoping out initial designs and sitting in a conference room. And Wi-Fi 7, it's a pretty cool evolution, just bench testing stuff, just playing with things at home. You know, as a home user, you know, trying to get that max throughput on the marketing numbers. And, you know, it's fun to be able to lay out all my clients and get out my, my Intel BE200 laptop here and, wow, 2300 megabits over the air with a real client. I'll be it with some disclaimers that I'll talk about in a minute. And also, being in a congested residential environment, the new 6 gigahertz spectrum that we introduced with our 6E APs and now with Wi-Fi 7. Uh, for big scale deployments, you've got those 59, 20 megahertz slices here in the US. Um, you've got the 320 megahertz chunks new with 7 that you can play with. If you're, if you're a home user, you've got clear airtime. And we're seeing more and more regulatory environments open up the 6 gigahertz channels to play with. Um, we're actually in a position right now where countries are passing regulation to allow it faster than we update AP firmware. So it's, it's a fun game to keep ahead and make sure that we're giving people all the spectrum they need. Uh, South America recently has really opened up a lot. Uh, Europe is still about 500 megahertz compared to our 1200, but still plenty to play with. And that's really been our marketing story for Wi-Fi 7. And indeed, this is sort of what every vendor has done. We have focused on Punk Train, the 496 QAM, the, the MLO, all of this stuff that you've seen a million times. But there's a caveat here, and it's something they don't want to talk about. This is a performance network. I got that 2300 megabit number by setting an AP on my counter and just putting my laptop right there. That's how you get that 496 qualm. That's how you get that high performance. You make sure you have nothing on there but Wi-Fi 7 clients. You make sure that you have clean air. Then you get these really cool marketing numbers. So that's where the six user per AP that Sam was talking about. <laughs> right, yeah. But right, this is how they market it to you. And this works great for, for residential deployments, maybe. Um, you're still not getting 496 qualm more than like 13 feet away from an AP. Um, but this is just a, really a disservice to the industry because when you're building an enterprise network, you don't care that a user is going to be able to get 2300 megabits. You don't really care if they're going to get 230. As long as that network is stable and works and you can connect 100, 1,000, 5,000 devices to your campus's Wi-Fi, care that it works. And so with that said, why would we even care about Wi-Fi 7 for enterprise? Why not just roll 6? Why not just roll 6E if you need the spectrum? Why do we need to go to that standard? Better band steering, low latency, low jitter, enhanced QoS. You see, we don't want to focus on just that bandwidth story. We don't want to focus on those meme features that are new with Wi-Fi 7. Because at Ubiquity, one of the things we believe is that technology is meaningless without a good user experience. Unless there is a compelling user story, there's no one who's going to want to upgrade bump standards or even want to consider putting Wi-Fi 7 in their, in their applications. You know, when I swap my laptop to go from 6E to 7, you know, I could replace a card. You can't do that with a phone. You can't do that with integrated silicon. You have to make a dedicated decision. We have relationships with a lot of device manufacturers, a lot of client manufacturers, to uh, talk to them about what their future plans are. And Wi-Fi 7, like Wi-Fi 6E, has a lot of optional features, a lot of things that are still in flux. And so we're trying to present not just a story to you as Wi-Fi professionals to consider deploying Wi-Fi 7, but a story to them as well. Because without client support, everything that we do on the AP side is also meaningless. It's a synergistic, and a good use of the word synergy, approach that has to be done here. So let's talk about how band steering works with MLO, because this is particularly interesting. Uh, these are PCAPs, uh, screenshots that I got from doing real uh, MLO clients. I believe this is a Pixel 8 Pro. I can make all of these available shortly after my talk here. Uh, but how band steering works is interesting, because normally, you know, we all know how 802.11v works, moving the clients around. But because there's an association maintained on all those bands, there's no management frames sent. If the client needs to roam, it'll just move right over. You're literally freeing up airtime 
through no extra effort other than just turning on MLO on your network. And we've tested MLO with some clients that support it, some clients that don't support it. But a reasonable mix of semi-modern IoT, MacBooks, Windows laptops, we haven't seen any issues with rolling MLO out, at least in our normal scale lab testing. MLO is still very early, of course, but it's neat to be able to see that these clients are roaming and without that management frame overhead. An MLO, if you haven't seen it yet, how it actually works under the skin, there's an actual discovery beacon. First, it sends out a probe request, just broadcast, gets it back from the AP. The AP says, hey, I'm a member of this MLD, this multi-link group, and it says, you know, I'm also broadcasting on these bands. That way, it's a client decision, the client will get all the information about nearby APs that might have MLO working, and then choose to associate first on one band, and then set up the other associations. Today, I'm really focused on, on MLSR, multi-link single radio. There's been a lot of talk from other vendors, and a lot of talk from device manufacturers doing their cool CES showcases about, look at our link aggregation that we can do with Wi-Fi 7. The problem with link aggregation as a story is that that's multi-link multi-radio. If you're building a laptop, if you're building a phone, do you want to put in multiple Wi-Fi radios? If you're building multiple Wi-Fi radios into your device, you're sucking down extra power almost all of the time for no benefit, at least at this point. And even then, so people can upload photos a little bit faster if they have the WAN connection to do it. It's, it's almost meaningless. The real story in MLO is not how fast can I go, it's a story of how fast can I move between bands. It's a real shame that the multi-AP association got kicked to Wi-Fi 8, but even so, this is the cool and most important story of MLO. I just skipped through the association there, but that's also how that works. I've got this. Uh, Again, all of this will be visible in some PCAPs that I'll distribute. But the association request is really interesting how it first associates on one band and then starts setting up on the others. Hey, Tom, I have a question. Yeah. I, I like where you're, you're headed with this. It's impressive. Do we really want our clients to roam to 2.4? You no, know, that's a question. And I mean, just we can roam there really fast with this. Yeah. But I don't know if I want that to happen. Well, with... With our implementation of MLO, you can set up tri-band or dual-band. And in fact, the Pixel 8 Pro, the Samsung S24 Ultra, the devices we've been testing, only support dual-link. So if offered on 2.456, they'll set up on 5 and 6. They won't even consider 2.4. And that seems to be something that the device manufacturers have come to sort of holistically, which I think we're all happy about. But yeah, in, in all honesty, we haven't been able to make a device roam down to 2.4. But roaming between six and five, that's far more useful. And in the PCAP, we've got a six gigahertz, just pure SSID broadcasting as well as an MLO. This is the only thing that popped up in Wi-Fi Explorer as, as the key difference, the actual MLO extension. And you can see some of the features that we have enabled there. Um, Specifically, we have, we have multi-link single radio support on, multi-link multi-radio off for now, because frankly, we haven't seen any client support for it yet at all. Um, we're working with some of our partners to see if that's coming. We, we can't reveal anything yet. But I think what everybody at home is looking for, what you guys are looking for is, when can I play with it? <laughs> everybody sitting here in this room is going to get a free full stack Unify deployment. You're getting our Cloud Gateway Ultra, you're getting an 8-port switch, and you're getting a U7 Pro. I should be clapping. Can, can, can we, we clap? clap? Um, <laughs> you can clap. I gave out free stuff in Chicago, I'll give out free stuff again. <laughs> what, what for everybody else? Ones? Yeah, who people aren't sitting in the room. <laughs> You're getting a chip. Don't you worry. I promise you. <laughs> okay, right. Now I'll clap. <laughs> For everybody at home, your Wi-Fi 7 APs are getting the MLO upgrade with 7.1 firmware and network 8.2. Oh, there you go. We're going to turn it on for you then. You all can start playing with it with all of your supported clients. And I've been playing around with um, Linux 6.10 is going to introduce the, the mainline changes for the Intel BE200 card. Really excited about that. I compiled a, a very early version of it. It, it works pretty well, actually. So. 
we're excited to start iterating on this, start working with more and more manufacturers. But now let's shift gears and get off of MLO and talk about latency and quality of service. Radio technology has come a long way in terms of QoS over Wi-Fi. You know, now you can set QoS priorities on an AP for general traffic. And there have been some proprietary solutions in the past. Uh, I believe one vendor's was called Fastlane, where it could work with, I believe, Apple phones and be able to prioritize traffic that way. That's now built into the standard as something called stream classification service. Your phone is actually able to tell the AP, hey, I'm going to send this kind of traffic and I want it prioritized like this. That's a very powerful story. And we're looking to see more and more devices support that. But the real thing I want to call out about our specific Wi-Fi 7 implementation is restricted target wait time. We are rolling with that out of the box today. Now, you might think, why? It's an optional feature for Wi-Fi 7. What's the point of turning that on? All it does is it allows clients to say, hey, yo, AP, I need some specific airtime, just completely clear of everybody else so I can beacon, I can talk. By doing that, you're guaranteeing low latency because the AP doesn't have anything else to process at the time. If you've got something like factory automation, VR, you want to be able to have that controlled wait time and you want to be able to have that guaranteed time sensitive networking. Now, is there client support for this yet? We're not really seeing it. But to Craig's point, we're introducing Wi Fi 7 at 179 US. By introducing it at such a low cost, working with our partners, really democratizing the technology, we want to spur manufacturers to adopt this. Is it an optional feature? Yeah. Is it going to be everywhere? We're going to make sure of it. And so let's summarize Wi-Fi 7 and sort of where we are today with it. All the Wi-Fi marketing you see out there mm -hmm. is telling the wrong story. This isn't a throughput story. This isn't a crazy story about, look at this, I got three bands going at the same time. No. User experience first. When somebody's sitting in a stadium, when somebody's sitting in the airport Wi-Fi, if they have to jump on a quick call, they want that quick call to work. How much does a voice call consume anyway? A few hundred kilobits? Not a lot. Maybe, maybe if you're going to a video call, five to ten megs? You want that to be steady, and that's the key point. When you have more seamless 5, 6 gigahertz roaming with MLO, when you have time-sensitive networking, both for your IoT and for your latency-sensitive applications, when you have stream classification working, and when you have clear airtime at scale, that is the Wi-Fi 7 story, and that is why we're passionate about it here at Ubiquity. So currently, your meshing only uses 5 gigahertz. That's correct. Are you guys looking at 6 gigahertz as your backhaul? We have been, um, we've been looking into it. Um, currently, it's something that we're exploring, just prototyping in the lab. But yeah, we've been, we've been looking at it. Okay, other question. This is from Discord. You shouldn't have probably posted there. Oh, no. Mm -hmm. um, what's up with your naming? So you kind of follow a certain fruit company mm -hmm. naming convention. What's up with that? And I'll be done. <laughs> I mean, it, it's... <laughs> The whole point is that we want to be able to have people understand at a glance the, where the product fits in the category. So if I'm building the best network right now, I want a Dream Machine Pro Max, right? It's got the enhanced throughput. It's got some extra goodies in there. I want to pair it with some Pro Max switching and Pro Max APs. I can just know at a glance that that is the scale of network that I want. Likewise, if I'm budget conscious or I want to deploy a small network, I'm looking at our ultra line. The products all work together and you can mix and match any scale you want, but it's to be able to give you an instant point of reference without looking at a data sheet and without memorizing a, a crazy uh, encyclopedic knowledge of how model numbers work. So is it like just the, like the Pro versus the Pro Max or Ultra, we're talking memory, CPU, some of those? Exactly, memory, hardware. CPU, chipset, um, sometimes, sometimes software features if it's enabled by a certain chipset. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Speaking of scale, um, what about scaling um, to thousands, tens of thousands of really, really small sites in a unified dashboard? Like 100,000 1AP sites. Hold that question because that is actually Andrew's job. 
Oh, well, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> nice segue there. Thanks. Beautiful. Uh, you, you've got, you all have mentioned in the past a bunch of new SKUs coming this year. You got it. This is this is exciting. You also mm -hmm. mentioned stuff about different different port configurations, dual port configurations, lag, et cetera, et cetera. Is there, have there been any other announcements that have come out, or is there anything else that you guys have available right now that you can share? I guess what I what I can share the spot there. What I can share is what I can what I've repeated at, at UWC, and that is that we have somewhere around uh, we have quite a few <laughs> Wi-Fi SKUs that are still coming. We have models for outdoor. We have models that have a lot more features, uh, more higher capacity chipsets, more higher capacity radios. Um, there's a whole lot coming that'll run the gamut all the way from, you know, low low price all the way up to to big boys. And in the enterprise space, you guys are you know you're making this move into the enterprise space. Yeah. Are, is there a significant amount of those models that are moving into that space, or is it? I mean, how big is this? Like. How big is this push in enterprise? Because it's you guys are playing in a different sandbox now. And granted, we all we've all used your product. We all love the product. It's good stuff. Yeah. But when you compare it to the last three vendors that we've had in this room, well established, blah 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 blah. Not that you're not. You guys are, are there. But there's just a, a different feel to to what they're doing. How do you feel like you all can compete in that space coming in as a solution that traditionally has been like we all have it in our home. But would we all put it in our carpeted spaces? You know, that's a, that's an excellent question, and that's a good way of putting it. Ultimately, our story is one of just scale and growth. You know, we started with, as Craig said, five gigahertz point to point, adapting Wi-Fi cards to be able to do that. Yeah. And we're looking at it from first principles. What do enterprises really need? What do what do our customers really want us to do? Where do they want us to go? The enterprise push is encompassing pretty much all of our verticals. Okay. I can't give any more detail than that, but it is a, it is a concerted push from every product team here. We have had a lot of buy-in across every part of the business. People wanting to grow, people wanting to take that next step, people who have even said, hey, you know, I used to have a small office, now my business is growing, I need more oomph, what have you got for us? And it's for those people that we've done our enterprise scalability story. We've talked to partners, we've talked to professionals about what they want to see and the pain points that they see with other vendors. And we're trying to design basically with no legacy weight that we have to carry around. Yeah. If someone had to do an enterprise scale networking solution, how would it look if they had to not worry about the past and could just start fresh? So does that mean like there's gonna be a, like a for enterprises, is going to be a separate, maybe a uh, uh, hardware product line, a separate cloud instance. Is it going to be separated out, or is it going to be all still the same? <laughs> I, <laughs> Tom's you're, you're, asking me, you're asking me such vague questions. I have to then buffer it through the through the internal voice of legal in my head. Yeah, it's, uh, I, it's fine. It's fine. <laughs> you have reached the point where, <laughs> in short, in short. Um, what you're going to see is the, the same great basis that we've used for our products, the same great basis, the same great team, and the same great people inside of Ubiquity that have put together um, our existing product line and some of the new stuff like Enterprise Fortress Gateway that are going to work on some of our other enterprise gear. Okay. I think he goes and then I go. I'll just redo my last question. Can you justify why your marketing says 350 to 500 yeah. devices per EP. Uh, I, I probably can add on to that one because uh, thank you for uh, uh, you know, putting a touch of reality to the marketing jargon out there. Yeah. Uh, but I think your own marketing is kind of doing a disservice because in that same, like right above that line, it talks about 140 square meters yeah. of coverage per AP, which kind of goes in the same line without explaining all the details. That's when we end up solving problems because somebody read that marketing and said, well, they told 140 yeah. square meters and now they use that mathematical equation to come out with a number of APs. Excellent question. So I'll start with the radio associations. Like Craig said, those are done with basically clients at rest, clients that are just associated to the AP but not actually passing traffic. A lot of times that 350 versus 500 restriction is because of the chipset. The radio has to be able to maintain that number of associations. There has to be enough memory on the board to be able to track that. 
all of these are inbuilt limitations of the hardware. But is there any, any reality in an enterprise play you're trying to move to where 350 clients could be on a single AP and it actually does more than let them just be associated? You know, it's a, it's a good question. At, at, the, at the FedEx forum, I was involved with some of the design work there. I've seen well over 150 APs that are at least have connected to a single, or 150 clients have connected to a single AP, or that appear to be connected at one time. Now those clients aren't doing anything, they're not passing any traffic, but I have seen a significant high number of them at least connected, because at least when you're doing something like a sports arena, those phones are going to be away for most of the time, and then when there's a break in action, everybody's phones comes out, and then there's a burst of traffic, right? But to to your point about you know how do you determine space, that's actually done by our testing team. We will actually set up an AP. Uh, we do testing both indoors and outdoors in specific environments, and we come up with that number based on the testing of our hardware team. Now, yes, it, it's a question of does that actually cover that many square meters? Well, yes, it does. What power well, it, levels it, would like? But, uh, but, it, <laughs> yeah, it can, cover, it can cover even more, but then, I'm, and there might be fine print and then explanation. Yeah. Like, 140 square meters of, you know, rack space or, or uh, office space or yeah. bookshelves. Ultimately, so, that's just a quick rule of thumb. And Andrew, I keep trying to segue to this guy. <laughs> software and I had a hardware question. Can, can show you how we have some more advanced design tools that can help you better understand how it work in a more representative simulation of your space. Additionally, I just want to say that we, we are working with Ekahau, Sidos, and Hamina to make sure that all of our APs are in their design tools as well. So when you need to make a more fine-grained tool, you want to do a deployment with a bunch of U7 Pros, you'll be able to just drop those in and be able to simulate them and, and do all of your site surveys as normal. Good, Tom. So right. I, I do have a question to grab you before you hand off. Sure thing. Uh, when you say scalable, are you talking about like a single site that's real large? Or how about like a small, medium business that might have 10,000 locations? All of the above. All of the above. Um, just speaking from experience, you know, I started out, um, my home lab started out before I even worked for Ubiquity with the absolute smallest gear possible. And I've kept that same site rolling forward as we've introduced newer and newer products. I've never truly started from scratch. I've been able to keep those upgrades going for my single site.